Well, thank all of you uh, for coming, Larry. Thank you for the introduction. Jim, thank you for the original invitation, and thanks to Hisham for so adroitly exploiting that invitation to offer me the chance to talk with you uh, this afternoon. The invitation for this talk um, grew out of uh, a piece, uh, a short piece that I published in a blog in, in the Washington Post, a blog called The Monkey Cage, named after H.L. Mencken's characterization of politics and democracy in a democracy. And, and that piece made, made the observation, and, and in many ways a little more than an observation, and I want to caution that what I'm going to be talking about is really pitched at a fairly general level of communicating some, some broad themes about this, this general subject of authoritarianism in an era of mass politics. And, and the claim that I, that I made in the article and which I'd like to elaborate on in my comments this, this afternoon, is that as we've watched the consequences of the Arab uprisings unfold, what we've seen is not so much the reassertion of familiar modes of authoritarian governance, but in fact, a fairly significant, in some cases at least, fairly significant transformation in the forms and contents through which authoritarian incumbents are governing. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of spin that out a bit uh, in my comments this afternoon. And, and I'm doing that in, in, in part in the hope that um, you'll offer some feedback and comments um, on these observations. Uh, this is an, an area in which I'd, I'd like to be doing some more work over the coming months. It's, it's very uh, preliminary at the moment. And so you're offering me really a terrific opportunity to to characterize some broad trends, to talk about some of the factors that I think are driving those trends, and, and I hope that will give us a chance um, for you to tell me how profoundly misguided I am, to put me on the right track, and to ensure that when this eventually moves along, it'll do so much more, uh, in a much more compelling way than it would have without your insight. Um, so what I wanted to do was kind of really just to take stock of where I think broad trends in authoritarian governance have moved over the period since the start of, of the Arab, Arab Spring, the Arab uprisings, and, and specifically talk about how the uprisings have transformed patterns of authoritarian governance in, in the Middle East. And, and as a way to get started, I thought I'd just try and provide some baseline indicators about where we are with respect to governance in the MENA region broadly. And uh, I want to I do that in a way that doesn't uh, belabor the obvious, but I think it's pretty clear, and I'm sure everyone in this room acknowledges, that since the start of the Arab uprising in 2011, uh, and, and we just marked the fourth anniversary of the Egyptian Revolution, January 25th, last week. We're now in the fifth year of, of, of the, these uprisings and the post-uprising period. And, and during that, that, that span of time, I think we'd all agree that the governance picture in the region has changed dramatically and, and not for the better. We really have only one case, Tunisia, which we were discussing a little bit before, lunch where we've seen promise of democratic consolidation. But beyond that, what we've seen, I think, is a fairly systematic and broad-ranging erosion in possibilities for democratization across much of the region. And, and one of the consequences of this that I think is interesting is that arguments about authoritarian resilience, arguments about the future of authoritarian governance in the Arab world, have now become much more meaningful and, again, acquired a certain salience as research issues in a way that I think was not expected at the start of the uprising in 2011. If you recall some of the work that people like Jack Goldstone published, uh, that, that, that a number of others put out, Greg Gauz, uh, a scholar mostly of the Persian Gulf, um, there was a real sense that 2011 marked a decisive break that the condition that Larry described in the 2010 article in the Journal of Democracy about why the, the Middle East was the only world region not to par participate in the third wave of global democratization um, had finally joined that wave and so on. Uh, I myself um, 
had moments in which I wondered whether the emphasis I had placed on the adaptive capacity of authoritarian regimes and resilience was a little bit misguided. Um, but as time has unfolded, as these events have unfolded, I think we've seen that these um, these questions about resilience and, and adaptability have regained a certain amount of, of, of currency. And, and in fact, I think we do have some indicators that, that highlight this in, in a very dramatic way. If we look, for instance, at Freedom House data for general levels of freedom, percentage of freedom by population, actually by region, this is 2014 data. What that means in Freedom House terms is that it reflects um, their scoring of the calendar year 2013. Well, you can see where the MENA region sits. And what's all the more striking is that uh, the MENA region occupies that position, even with the inclusion of Israel. In 2014 Freedom House report, there was not a single Arab country that was ranked fully free. So that was at the start of 2014. If we look at the current data, this the Freedom House, Freedom House issued its 2015 report last week. Um, it, it is based again on calendar year uh, FY 14, uh, calendar year 14 data, but it shows a modest improvement in percentage of freedom in the Middle East and North Africa. Eurasia, which was not on the bar chart I showed a minute ago, has now. Um, overtaken uh, the Middle East as the least free region of the world. I think we have President Putin to thank for that, no doubt. But it's still, it, it's, it, it's not an image which, despite the improvement that we've seen, it really is uh, the result of, of Tunisia alone, I, I should say, because many other countries, Libya, Iraq, experienced downgrades uh, in the Freedom House rankings. I, I sit on the Freedom House Advisory Board for their Middle East um, uh, rankings every year, and when it became clear that the aggregate scores for Tunisia would put it in the fully free catalog, uh, category, there was actually applause in the room because this was the first Arab country to achieve a fully free rating from Freedom House in, I think, probably more than 20 years, maybe more than 30 years. So it was noted as a signal event. But still, I think the first since Lebanon. First since Lebanon in the early 70s, right. Um, so it, it was it was seen as a signal uh, moment, but but the aggregate impact on the overall scores of the region, of course, um, were far more muted, and and that that significant that that positive blip uh, really didn't do very much to alleviate concerns either within the region or internationally about the broader trends. At, at work uh, in, in the Arab world, governance trends at work in the Arab world. Although it's worth noting that the Arab world is not the only source of concern from the Freedom House perspective. In fact, if you look at the FY15, at the calendar year 15 report, the overall title of the report is Discarding Democracy Return to the Iron Fist. That is the global title for the report. So, so clearly, um, there's concern about broad trends, but within MENA, I would say they're especially uh, acute. And we have other indicators as well. Um, the popular sentiment indicators uh, that are, are uh, confirming this general concern about the drift of governance in the region. And of course, the single most important of those popular sentiment indicators are political cartoons. Um, this is a cartoon of General Sisi managing the electoral campaigns in Egypt with all the precision of a military campaign, um, which I, I, I liked very much. Of course, that could not have been published today. That was that that is now maybe a year old. Never even make it into the media today. And another one that I especially like was. Elect Bouteflika, dead or alive, from Algeria. Um, those of you who know Algeria will know that that the uh, incumbent ran for re-election despite grave uh, uncertainty about whether he was still breathing. So um, we do we do have have these these concerns about. Uh, the direction of governance in the region, both with respect to indicators like Freedom House and with respect to how humorists in the region are are communicating about where things are are headed. And and one of the results of this, one of the things we've seen uh, 
in the literature, one of the things we've seen in the media is this language of authoritarian regression. It's this language of the region returning to the patterns of authoritarian governance that defined it in the pre-Arab um, pre uprising period. Uh, Nathan Brown has written about authoritarian regression in Egypt. There are other scholars who've expressed a similar, uh, who've used a similar vocabulary uh, to talk about what they see happening. But this is where the piece I did in the Post and, and some of my own work suggests that I think we really do need to be careful. I think we need to be very, very cautious about drawing too tight a, a connection between the modes of authoritarian governance that we see taking shape in the region today and, and those of the pre-uprising period. And, and I would argue, as I suggest in that, in that blog piece, and in a sort of draft paper that's growing out of, of, of that work is, is that this is, in fact, not a back to the future moment. We're not, in fact, seeing simply a reassertion of earlier modes of authoritarian governance. What we're seeing instead is a further step in the reconfiguration of authoritarian governance in, in the region uh, in, in one set of cases. And in another set of cases, we're seeing what I would describe as really a very sharp and very distinctive rupture uh, in established patterns uh, of authoritarian governance. And I'll say more about that in, in a moment. What I see unfolding in general terms, uh, what, I, what I'd suggest is that these kinds of transformations that I'm highlighting in the period since 2011 are really moving us toward what I would what I would view somewhat tentatively as two fairly distinctive models of authoritarian governance in, in the MENA region. They have some things in common, but I think they also have some significant differences that make it worthwhile to view them as, as distinctive. The first is a model that I would characterize in terms of authoritarian upgrading 2.0, and I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by that uh, in a moment. And the second model, the, the much more troubling model that I see emerging in the region um, is, is this, this approach or these practices that I view as reflecting a fairly distinct rupture with, with what uh, was common in the pre-2011 period. And I would characterize this as the emergence of what I would call repressive exclusionary forms of authoritarian governance that I think mark a fairly decisive break with very uh, well consolidated earlier models, which I would define as inclusionary, corporatist, and redistributive strategies of authoritarian governance that I think dominated virtually the entire region for much of the post-colonial period. So when I talk about authoritarian upgrading and then upgrading 2.0, what I have in mind is a strategy, uh, a, set of, a set of tactics that I identified around 2006, 2007 as defining a broad framework adopted by authoritarian incumbents to respond to the very specific challenges that they confronted in the late 90s and the 2000s. Challenges of new telecommunications technologies, challenges of pressures for economic liberalization, challenges of um, pressures for uh, democratic reform. And, and that these, these challenges produced uh, a, a set of, of, of responses aimed clearly at ensuring the survival of these authoritarian regimes. I define them in, in terms of authoritarian upgrading. Uh, you know, these are the, the five categories. I'm not gonna go into these in, in any kind of, of, of detail. But I do think that they had an important impact on regime types in the region in the 90s and 2000s. I do think that these strategies had some significant effects. I think if we look at this um, graph, what we see in the 90s and into the 2000s is something of a significant shift in the character of regime types in, in the region. This marked most importantly by this move from closed autocracies to multi-party uh, autocracies. Um, and um, 
my own hunch, I, I say this without any evidence whatsoever, I mean, I, I have a, but, but my own hunch is that this, this reconfiguration of authoritarian regime types is in some respects a product of these um, practices, these tactics of authoritarian upgrading that uh, regimes adopted around this, this same time. And, and I also think um, it's fair to say that even while upgrading pushed a number of regimes in the region, not all of them certainly by any means, but a number of regimes in the region toward what appeared to be less repressive uh, strategies of, of governance, certainly in terms of how some segments of Arab societies experience these regimes, that overall, these changes notwithstanding, the uprisings of 2011 can also be understood in part as a kind of backlash against some of the shortcomings and the limitations of this general set of practices that regimes across the region adopted in, in different ways during the 90s and, and 2000s. And, and I think in particular, the uprisings can be seen in some respects as a backlash against the controlled, politically motivated strategies of economic reform that in virtually every single Arab state tended to benefit very, very small groups of often business actors, but not only business actors who were closest to regimes and, and produced very, very large categories of losers, in particular among social groups that had previously been uh, significant beneficiaries of, of um, regimes, groups that had relied on the state um, as a provider of economic security. And we can see throughout the 2000s, and I'm very pleased to draw on Joel's data for this, that this backlash was not something that simply exploded on the scene in 2011. Drawn from economic protests in particular in Egypt, overlapping with a period of increasing commodity price increases, we can see even before 2011 how popular mobilization around um, the effects of some of the strategies associated with, with authoritarian upgrading were beginning to drive citizens into oppositional forms of, 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 of politics. And, and I, would, I would argue that, that, that the um, massive expansion of protest movements in 2011 is in some res respects a kind of outgrowth of, of the foundations that were laid by some of these earlier phases of, of escalating but much smaller protests. Now, um, by and large, despite these trends, regimes didn't do very much to respond to this growing pattern of popular mobilization and economic grievance in the period before 2011 um, that may have been largely because of their confidence and their ability to contain mobilization, to, to, um, to repress uh, collective action, to, to disorganize and demobilize publics that felt grievances. Um, whatever the whatever the the level of confidence they might have felt about their ability to manage these 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 kinds of, of sentiments without really responding to them, um, I, I think they they have certainly since the uprisings taken some very concrete steps, adopted new kinds well some some similar kinds of strategies, some new kinds of strategies, in an effort to deal with. The, the backlash um, produced in, in reaction to these strategies of authoritarian upgrading. And I think that in general what we're seeing is that these responses are moving the region toward these two broad modes of authoritarian governance that I, that I outlined um, a, a moment ago. Uh, on one hand, what we've seen across the region since 2011 is an effort by regimes, pretty much without regard to regime type, to simply buy off protesters. There's a massive short-term expansion in social spending following the outbreak of the Arab Spring. This, this is now a little bit 
um, out, out of date, but I thought it was so interesting because this is the initial year of the uprisings and what it shows across a variety of different regimes, some of which were more or less affected by, by the uprisings, the extent to which governments simply threw money at social programs. In Jordan, we get a 200% increase in, in social spending, massive increases in other countries even calibrated against what are already quite extraordinarily high levels of public spending on, uh, on, on public subsidies. So there was this effort to try and, and simply throw money at the problem, buy off protesters, um, address economic grievances in the short term by, by spending money as, as one piece of the strategy. But, but beyond this, I think reactions have moved into broadly different directions. In a, in a small number of cases, including, um, I think, Morocco, I think Jordan, some of the Gulf states, um, I think regimes have largely sustained and expanded the tactics I've characterized as, as authoritarian upgrading. This is sort of the upgrading 2.0 uh, I, I mentioned. But they've turned those tactics in a far more repressive direction, even than had been the case in the 90s and, and 2000s. If you look at trends, for instance, in um, regulations governing civil society, they have been tightened and deepened and intensified pretty much across the region. If you look at trends with respect to control over the media and over internet communications, these have followed a similar trajectory in pretty much every country across the region. And Many of these governments have moved to further distance themselves and shift their diplomatic and economic and strategic relationships away from the West and toward uh, more, more regimes that are, are likely to view them a bit more favorably. Uh, so there is this one set of cases where they have responded to the challenge of mass politics, not so much by abandoning the tactics of authoritarian upgrading, but by um, uh, in fact, intensifying them, expanding them, coming to rely on them even more, despite the negative effects that they produced during that earlier phase in which they, they were used. But in the second set of cases, and, and here I would put Egypt, I would put regime-held areas of, of Syria, uh, I think Iraq, perhaps, Bahrain, um, I think we're seeing variants of authoritarian governance that are moving in a different, and in my view, a much, much darker direction toward these more repressive and more exclusionary systems of rule. Syria clearly stands out as a fairly dramatic uh, example of that trend, but there are some attributes in common across these different cases. In each of them, regimes have taken much, much sharper steps to contain, to constrain political contestation. They have moved to reshape and, in many cases, I think, to narrow the social bases on which these regimes uh, depend. They've expanded the roles and influence of intelligence and security services and the military. And in the Syrian case, in the Bahraini case, well, in the GCC countries in general, I think, um, and now perhaps to some extent in Yemen and well, as well, this shift has taken on an increasingly sectarian tone in addition to all of these other, other, other dimensions. And um, finally, we, all, we also see these governments moving to accelerate and deepen their engagement with um, international networks of authoritarian allies, even though these are somewhat different in different cases. In, in Egypt, it's much more um, Russia and uh, the Gulf states that are becoming critical allies in, in, in Syria. Uh, it's becoming Russia and Iran that are emerging as critical allies. But, but we're seeing uh, this, this combination of kind of expanded, deepened, more repressive versions of these upgrading tactics with much more far-ranging shifts in how these regimes are organizing themselves socially uh, in, in, in terms of, of the, the centrality they place on the repressive apparatus and in a number of other ways as, as well. And so one of the conclusions that I think comes out of this, maybe an obvious conclusion, is that if we look at the broader impact of the uprisings of, of, of 2011, it doesn't seem all that far-fetched to suggest that 
Um, one of the most important consequences has not been to create democratic openings, but has been to contribute even further to this process of authoritarian transformation and, and to move the region along a couple of these pathways that I've, that I've suggested toward more repressive, more narrowly based, more insular forms of, of authoritarian governance. And, and I think these forms are going to be even less vulnerable than their predecessors were to efforts by the international community and local reformers to achieve any kind of meaningful um, democratic political change. But, but that, you know, that observation, that conclusion still leaves us with a question. And this is what I want to kind of wrap up with. And, 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 and the question is, how do we account for these trends? What, you know, even if we take as a starting point that these authoritarian regimes do possess these kind of adaptive qualities that I've attributed to them, um, why are these transformations <clears throat> taking on the particular forms that we see in these, um, in these countries in, in the Arab world? And, and my short answer to that question is that I don't think I really know yet. Um, I, 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 have some, I have some notional ideas. I'd, I'd like to try them out on you. I, I, I actually think they do hold some promise. But I would be very reluctant to oversell them. Um, and, and so it would be very interesting to have your, your, your feedback on them. What I've begun to argue is that this shift toward these different forms of authoritarian governance is in part uh, a product of a process that's already received a fair amount of attention, which is the exhaustion of the populist redistributive social pacts that really dominated social policy, dominated state society relations, conceptions of citizenship for much of the post-colonial period, the end of these authoritarian bargains, in other words, which, which has a very important consequence, because I think as these regimes face massive levels of economic grievance, framed in terms of economic marginality, demands for inclusion, demands for participation, demands for economic dignity, the exha exhaustion of this earlier formula really rules out possibilities of restoring redistributive inclusionary strategies as a response to this rising and, and expanding levels of economic security that, that Arab citizens are experiencing. There are, there are simply institutional and fiscal constraints about the range of policy <coughs> options that are available to incumbents if they want to remain in, in, in power, given the scale of the economic challenges that they face. And, and here, I don't want to get into this too much, but just to underscore the scale of these challenges, this is some fairly recent World Bank data on unemployment and youth unemployment trends globally. And you can see that even though I think the main figures are under-supported, I mean under underrepresented, there are just massive, massive um, employment challenges that these regimes face. And, and one of the questions is what, what kind of options are available to these regimes to overcome the employment gaps that these societies are wrestling with and what makes them all the more dangerous politically for some of these incumbents is the composition of, uh, of unemployment. Because when you look at it, you have as a percentage of overall unemployed, highly educated people are vastly overrepresented relative to some of the other cases in which unemployment, I'm sorry if you can't see that very well. Um, the red one is, uh, is in Jordan. It is the percentage of, of um, you know, a university educated individuals represented among overall unemployed um, um, segments of, of, of society. So, and, and, and these are communities that are particularly um, amenable to the kinds of mobilization and collective action that, that was so prominent during the, the, the Arab uprisings. So, so what I see in, in effect um, is that MENA political economies are beginning to look increasingly, I think, like the kind of conditions that Adam Jaworski associated with the emergence of poor capitalism in the global south. That this is really kind of, you know, despite some of the obvious differences in terminology we'd use if we were applying this to the Middle East, this is really very much 
the kind of context in which incumbents are struggling to deal with the extraordinary challenges posed by this massive upsurge in, in, um, in collective action mass mobilization uh, in, in, in the MENA region. And, and this, these conditions, I would argue, in an international context which also tends to privilege certain kinds of strategies for economic growth over others and so on, impose quite extraordinary constraints on the options available to incumbents to deal with the very specific challenges that mass politics pose. Um, I would argue as well that this is unfolding in an international context, and I've made this argument before that I think is increasingly congenial towards authoritarianism as a system of rule, where the legitimacy attached to liberal democracy is eroding, um, often fairly deeply in many parts of the world, and where processes of authoritarian learning and the dissemination of authoritarian practices into the main region from abroad is, is accelerating and deepening. Uh, and then finally, I would argue that, that this, this rupture, this shift, in some cases from earlier modes of governance, is a product of domestic contexts in which models of development have simply become increasingly securitized, and, and where mass politics is defined very explicitly as a threat to economic stability and economic growth and where state society relations, uh, uh, where conceptions of citizenship, where um, notions of what it is appropriate for citizens to expect from the state in economic terms are being recast in terms of the obligations of citizens to contribute to conditions of economic stability. And, and so I, I am kind of setting this out in only the very sketchiest of terms, but what I wanted to end with is the, the possibility, which I see as a real possibility, that what these configurations of, of, of governance, uh, these governance configurations suggest is that the region is in fact putting in place the foundations for a new social contract that it's putting in place the foundations for a social contract that is not the more inclusionary participatory one that many of us hoped would emerge in response to the quite extraordinary um, um, levels of economic exclusion that were visible in the region for much of the last decade. In 2002, 2003, I participated in a World Bank report called Unlocking the Employment Potential in the Middle East and North Africa toward a new social contract. And the hope was that the scale of economic exclusion of youth in particular would drive regimes toward more inclusionary forms of social contracts. I think we're seeing the opposite. I think we're seeing the emergence of much more chauvinistic rather than inclusionary conceptions of the economic role of the state, of state society relations. If you think about some of the literature on the rise of, of right-wing parties in, in Europe, Herb Kitchell's work, chauvinistic welfare um, systems and so on, I, I see many similarities to what's happening in a number of cases in the region. And these are cases in which I think the need to contain and repress mass politics and mass economic grievances that simply exceed the capacity of these regimes to address in more inclusive participatory ways is going to be a defining um, constraint, a defining feature in the systems of authoritarian governance that emerge from the Arab Spring. So that even as we recognize that the last several years represent in some ways you know, an episode of contention. It's one whose consequences, I think, are going to be um, enormously durable and, and long-lasting, and in ways that I think um, are quite troubling uh, in terms of governance trends in, in the Arab world. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Well. <laughs>